So my name is Adele Frizzell. Coach Tiffany Buck is here with me today, and we are going to be talking about my vacation and how I was able to maintain my weight on vacation without even trying. And um, maybe some of these behaviors are just unconscious and they come automatically to me. But let's talk about some of the things that you can do if you're worried about gaining weight while on vacation. And Tiffany's got questions for me. Uh, if you have any questions during this Facebook Live, please do comment below. We will answer them. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can also uh, make a comment. We do monitor our YouTube channel for comments. We do. I have a few questions, but before we jump into that, if you guys have any additional questions for Adele, we're going to try to keep this Facebook Live on the shorter side, but if you have questions, please drop them in the comments and we will get to them if we can. If not, we're going to be monitoring the comments. So uh, after the call is over, Adele is more than happy to answer your questions about her personal experiences. So don't hesitate to ask those questions, okay? Um, so Adele, welcome back. We're very happy to have you back. We missed you so much. Um, I know that you had an amazing time and I was very uh, jealous of some of the pictures that you uh, posted. I wanted to be with you next time, just pack me in your suitcase. Mm -hmm. um, but I was wondering, you mentioned uh, that you were not really trying to restrict your food intake or anything. So could you tell us a little bit about what the local diet looked like uh, while you were there? Was it a lot of lean proteins, a lot of veggies, or what did you find that you encountered the most? Okay, well, let's maybe just stick with Scotland because otherwise this thing will be hours long. But um, in, in Scotland, um, basically the food, you could get anything in the big cities. You could have sushi, you could have beautiful salads, you could have, you know, avocado uh, toast. Um, but when we were doing our walking tour, we were always given a traditional Scottish breakfast every single morning. And it was the same thing over and over again, regardless of where we stayed. So if we stayed in a hotel, we got a Scottish breakfast. If we, and sometimes a cold buffet was also there. Um, if we stayed in a uh, pub uh, accommodation or a B and B, it was the same thing. So the Scottish breakfast is um, pretty much it's going to be sausages, like link sausages. Uh, sometimes we were given an option to have vegan sausages, which personally I thought were awful. <laughs> it didn't matter where we had them; they were always they always gave us the same type of vegan sausage and it just didn't, it tasted like cardboard to me. Um, fried eggs, a kind of bacon, which was fairly fatty, um, not crispy at all. Baked beans. There was black pudding, which my husband actually enjoyed and tried for the first time, um, which is just oats and blood basically. Uh, and then there was yeah. haggis. <laughs> yeah, but healthy, right? High in iron. Um, oh, haggis. You say so. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> haggis is a traditional dish. I believe it's made from uh, sheep's heart and other organs, and it's wrapped in um, intestine. And haggis, I think it's made with oats and herbs and things like that. Um, and you know, a lot of people go, "Oh, gross!" You know, sheep's intestine and stuff. But like, hey, what are sausages made of? Basically, the same thing, right? When we buy sausages in the supermarket, they're wrapped in um, casings, which come from like intestine and stuff. Um, then there was something called tatty scones, which are potato scones, which are just very, very, very thin, like a flatbread almost, a uh, mix of potato and flour. And those were fried. Um, and then fried tomatoes and mushrooms and toast and jam and that kind of thing. And then um, in some places, there was also like a cold buffet where you could have more of a continental breakfast instead of a hot breakfast. You could have yogurt, uh, juices, uh, fruit, that coffee, that kind of thing. So it was always like quite a large breakfast. And, um, you know, as we were on our hiking holiday, because that's that's a big part of this uh why i was able to manage my weight was because i was hiking every day for nine days straight so i was expending four to five thousand calories a day i estimate i wasn't counting my calories but i'm knowledgeable enough to say i think i never went beyond three thousand calories a day 
So obviously in a deficit. And I noticed I was losing weight by day three. My pants were fitting looser and that kind of thing. And then oddly enough, it, I seemed to plateau. Um, then when the hiking holiday was over, I still had an appetite. I still had the hunger, the hiker hunger. And so I was eating 3000 calories a day, but not exercising so much. So I think I, I probably lost a few pounds and gained a few pounds and came back exactly the same at the end of the vacation. Cause it was two weeks of just kind of sightseeing and doing things in London and Portugal. And it was about, um, nine days of hiking. So yeah, okay. that was a typical breakfast. And then lunch might be something we'd buy in a convenience store on the way through a town. We might buy like a sandwich. It'd be kind of gas station food. And we'd eat desserty things like fudge or sweets, shortbread cookies, that kind of thing while we hiked. And then dinner, we would have a, I'd have a drink every night, like a cider, a pint of cider. Um, and then I might order a burger and fries, lasagna, that kind of thing. Um, so is all the things you can get here with some also local dishes like Colin Skink soup, which is a fish soup with uh, potatoes and a cream sauce, that kind of thing. So it sounds like a lot of their meals were high in carbs and high in fats, so not a lot of high protein. And I didn't hear a lot of vegetables in that mix either. Yeah. So with that in mind, how do you think that eating those foods did not lead to weight gain for yourself and also for the locals that you encountered? Yeah. So I was um, like, I lost weight because I was so active, but I think had I kept eating that way and not gotten the steps in, I would have gained weight. And it's interesting to me, like I, I was looking around in these villages and sometimes you know, this was remote. It was in the highlands and we might pass a village that had 200 people. One of the biggest villages was a thousand people in, in that we had gone through in four days and one convenience store, one pub, that kind of thing. Um, locals didn't have a lot of options for food unless they ate, you know, at those places or yeah. So I was looking around going, these people are not really overweight. They're not obese. Why is that? And I thought, well, I think they're just more active. Um, there's a lot of sheep around. And I think like, I noticed they weren't even using horses. I didn't never saw anyone on horseback. I, I think they walked the hills a lot. Um, I mean, I'm making assumptions here. I don't know what their lives are like, but just for an outsider looking in, I would see older people carrying their groceries or carrying things one in each hand, like a farmer's carry. I think they just get in a lot more steps and it offsets the food. They, um, because actually like, I actually was pretty convinced that Scottish people were not, didn't have a weight problem like Americans, but then after I was shocked to find out they do two thirds of Scottish people are overweight or obese. So that must've mm -hmm. just been in the cities because I certainly didn't yeah. see it in the more remote areas. Yeah, and that was actually going to be my, my next question is what did you notice? Um, one, about the different food availability, but you already kind of mentioned that in the cities, in the more populated areas, they had access to basically everything that we have access here. Um, did you notice that people were as active in the cities or did you do you think that they were not as active and they had a little more convenience access? So the only, they must not be as active, but I'm making an assumption there, right? So, um, and that's because they're in a more urban environment. They're probably not walking as much. They might be pay, taking public transportation or driving. Um, I was talking to a friend of mine whose grandma is Scottish and she remembers like being in Scotland as a kid. And she said her grandmother had string bags that she would walk to the grocery store every day to pick up something fresh. So she was getting an activity, but also keeping her muscles strong, carrying her groceries. And they had small fridges, so they'd always shop, but they, everybody had a garden. And she said in Aberdeen now, those places where the elderly, like it's elderly neighborhoods are being bought 
And where everyone had a garden in the front is being cemented and garages are being put in. So now they're not getting the physical activity from gardening or the fresh food. And everyone's got a car. So it's the lifestyle has changed and this is making people fatter. And this is, I think, happening around the world, right? So not just Scotland, but it's happening in America and Canada and Australia and everywhere. And our lifestyles are changing and we're eating more processed food. I mean, I did a little digging prior to this um, talk and Scotland authorities put out a thing saying Scottish people are eating an excess of calories for what they should be eating. And 50% of those calories are discretionary foods like high sugar treats, alcohol, things like that, that really are not full of nutrients or healthy. And that when it should be no more than 20% of calories coming from these discretionary foods for health reasons. So I think that's the lifestyle is just, it's just playing a role. Um, you can eat a traditional Scottish breakfast if you've got an active lifestyle, you know? Um, but if you don't, oh my goodness, like fried eggs, steaky bacon, black pudding, fried scones, like yeah, it'll catch up on you. I believe that. And I think that it's really important to just talk about the the accessibility of convenience items now, because you're right, before um, we had to do more of our own gardening. Now we can get almost everything that we need from a supermarket or grocery store. You can buy your clothes and your food in the same store. Um, so you're not having to make as many stops. And then also everyone has a car now. Um, and then even if people live in places where it's easy to walk, a lot of people are choosing not to walk. They're choosing to use their car and drive, you know, half a mile down the road because it's easier and it's faster and it's more convenient. So I think that convenience really does play a large role in our day-to-day -day activity levels. Yeah. And eating, so, out, you're, you're probably going to eat in excess of calories. Like I ordered lasagna. They love their French fries there. They served it with French fries, which I thought was just bizarre. I had a dish of lasagna served with fries. It's like, I would have liked a salad with this, some greens, you know? Um, I, I, it out. I mean, you eat that, that could be 2000 calories in one dish, which might be somebody's total energy needs for the day. And that's one meal. Yeah, that is crazy. Uh, I'll have some carbs with my carbs, please. <laughs> Um, so now that you're home, how, yep. did you notice that you had a difficulty returning to your new normal routine or do you feel like you were able to ease right back into it? Great question. Um, I've lost a couple more pounds since I've gotten home, which is cool. Uh, that hunger hike, that hiker hunger abated by the way, um, oh. over a period of a week. So it didn't stay spiked, which is great. I think the body just naturally adapts met metabolically to the demands you put on it. So, you know, more hiking, oh, I need more energy. It drives me to eat more food, right? And, and then it realizes and settles down, okay, you're not as active. You don't need as much food. So it adjusted beautifully. Um, it, I had not weight trained for over three weeks, almost a month because the week leading up to my trip was chaos. So I got in two workouts in London and they were two quick 30 minute upper body workouts. So I thought, oh man, I might've lost some muscle. I know you really don't start to lose muscle for two or three weeks, but you know, I also had a low protein diet. I brought protein bars with me. I did not bring protein powder. I did take creatine for half the time. I think that boosted protein, but honestly, some days I think I only got in 70 grams of protein all day. Um, most days I was trying to hit a hundred and I felt good if I hit a hundred, which is not a lot of protein. So it's like between the not weight training and not getting my normal amount of protein, I thought I'd lose some muscle mass, but it was exactly the same as when I left. So I was pleased with that. Um, I am back at the gym. I started last week with, um, I think I did only two workouts last week cause I was still overcoming jet lag. And I went easy. I did two sets of everything. And I, but my strength stayed about the same. And then this week I'm full power back doing three sets of everything. 
and I noticed no difference in strength. And my, according to my body composition scale, the muscle mass is the same. And yeah, so I'm, I'm really pleased about that. And I think the reason is at least I didn't eat below 70 grams of protein and I did try to hit hundred every day. I think the creatine may have assisted. Um, and also walking, walking is, can be really helpful for preserving muscle mass. I probably built some leg muscle. Definitely my calves grew. Um, my upper body though, seemed to retain whatever muscle mass I had. Maybe that's because I had hiking poles, which helped to stimulate my arm muscles. Uh, yeah. So I'm, I'm really pleased with how it went. That's awesome. So one of the things that we had talked about, um, covering during this call are the practical strategies for enjoying local cuisines. So I love that you mentioned that you brought you some of your own protein and you were able to keep your protein between 70 and hundred grams a day. Mm -hmm. um, and hundred grams for most people is pretty low for some people, depending on how big you are, that might be sufficient. But for Adele, I believe you typically eat what 150 ish grams of protein a day. Yeah, I've actually brought my protein down a little bit, but I'm trying to get 130 a day now. Um, and so that's the goal. And, you know, as you can see, I was well below that when I was traveling. So what are some practical strategies for other people other than bringing protein with them that you think that they could have, um, put in place when enjoying local cuisines? Yeah, I would try to bring some protein powder if you can. It's not easy to get your protein in when you're traveling, depending on the country, especially, um, uh, you know, like in some places you might only get a continental breakfast where they give you a croissant and a coffee for breakfast. So it, it's tough. Um, so really plan to have at least one protein rich meal in a restaurant. Make sure you've got like chicken or fish or something like that. Uh, it helped. I was able to hit higher protein when we got an Airbnb or, uh, you know, in a place with a little kitchen, because we would go shopping at the local Tesco or something. Uh, salmon locks are really cheap in Portugal and Scotland and London. So we would buy some locks, we would buy some uh, nice bread, some cream cheese, and we would have locks on cream cheese uh, in the morning. Um, you know, so I would try to get protein at every meal when we had our own Airbnb. When you're moving around, it can be harder. And, um, you know, yogurt, just look for eggs, that kind of thing. Now, the nice thing is in London and places which have their convenience stores can be quite nice compared to ours, where you get more fresh food and you could have like a set and they also, it's weird. They don't always list the protein as we put more emphasis on our packaging, our food labels for protein, you'd have to really dig to look at the protein content in these things. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but um, so I would just read labels and try to choose foods that are high in protein. I, so I might get, for example, a pokey, I could actually get a pokey bowl in the convenience store and it was delicious. And so it would have like chicken or salmon or something. And then I, they have these little packets of chicken bits and I could just pour it on top as well to increase the amount of protein. Um, so being able to get an Airbnb with a kitchen was a big deal, like have your own little fridge. And we would often eat two meals a day at home or at least one meal a day, you know, at home. And then we would eat out, uh, which was cheaper too, right? And so when we eat at a restaurant, I look for not just pasta, but something with a good amount of protein in it. Yeah. Awesome. I think that's right. Did you happen to get a photo of the nutrition labels? It'd be very interesting to see the differences in those. I, yes, I will look. <laughs> I'll look at my photos to see if I have one. They are different yeah. what they emphasize. And also like yeah. on alcohol, my husband got a photo because he looked, I think at a whiskey bottle and it yeah. said how much whiskey a, a man could have per day or a woman. And they, they talk in units it says so many units yeah. for a guy, so many units for a girl. And for a guy, it worked out to two to three units of whiskey, like servings a day. And a woman was one to two. And I was just blown away by that because I thought like that's a lot of alcohol in a week. That's up to 21 units or ounces of whiskey in a 
like, isn't that a bottle of whiskey a week? Like, <laughs> anyway, wow. I, I could be Speaking wrong, but it was shocking to me at the time. Yeah. Well, speaking of whiskey, another thing that you mentioned was the British culture and how it contributes to well-being, mm -hmm. um, contrary to our initial perception. So I'd love to know a little bit more about that. I know we talked about it a little bit, and I actually think it's pretty neat what they do. Yeah. So the pub culture is really strong in the UK, Ireland, you know, England, um, Scotland. I mean, the pubs have places you can stay at them too. And I think like at my initial view is what an unhealthy, uh, you know, not hobby, but activity to go to the pub almost daily. And now since I've been there, I have a different view. So a lot of people will go to a pub for a single drink and they will go and have a drink with their mates after work, right? And then they go home. The average person in Scotland, the average male drinks eight pints a week in a pub. So that's not, you know, having a pint isn't too bad, but really I think the benefit is that you get a sense of community. You get to blow off some steam and vent after work. It's a transition before you go home. Um, and it's some adult time. And I honestly think in, you know, in the States, I feel like people are really lonely. <laughs> adults don't really connect with other adults to have adult conversations, especially if they've got children. I mean, where do you, you can speak more to this than me, Tiffany, but like, where do you meet other adults? Maybe kids' birthday parties, soccer matches. There's not a lot of time for you to just have like an hour talking to another adult in an adult what setting. That? What, what is an adult setting? What is an adult setting? Like, can we, can we? No, uh, I'm literally at gymnastics three times a week with my kids. So I meet parents through gymnastics and I meet them through extra, ex, extra uh, curricular activities. Um, we go to play dates, we do things like that. And still the focus is on the kids most of the time. So it's very difficult um, to create relationships that's not centered around your kids. I mean, there's benefits to that, of course, because now you have a friend and they have a friend that they can play with as well. But you're right, like, for especially me when, with working from home, I don't have, I get off work and it's immediately child. It, there's no separation. And I think that that is definitely something the British culture has correctly because they're able to transition um, and they're able to have that little bit of downtime. Even my husband who works outside of the home, he doesn't get that downtime. He gets off work and he immediately comes home and then it's, he walks in the door and there's all these little munchkins going, daddy's home, you know? So yeah. it goes from one kind of chaos and stress to another kind of chaos and stress. So yeah. I think that really having that, that even if it's just 30 minutes to decompress and to breathe for a few minutes before yeah. transitioning into your other role as a parent, you know, that that could be very beneficial. Yeah. You're going from a, like a stressed out sympathetic, your sympathetic nervous system is supercharged at work and then it gets charged again at home even the home is supposed yeah. to be like you know a peaceful place when you've got kids it's, it's a bit different and everyone's asking things of you in both places right you go to a pub and you get to just like chill and have a conversation and maybe laugh and reminisce and it, I, I just think it for mental health it's so I could see it being so valuable and apparently like during two world wars, the British pubs remained open. They shut down during COVID and it was really, really hard on people. Uh, they were depressed. They missed that element of belonging and community and connection. And it made them mentally unwell. Um, apparently a Brit will spend 14 months of their life in a pub on average by the time they die. It's like a wow. second home. Yeah. Wow. Well, yeah. I think that we've answered all the questions that I had for you. I think that your trip sounds amazing. And I love getting to see the, the different benefits of the way that other cultures uh, operate and how that could be beneficial to apply. Um, so I guess my, my tip for anybody watching this is 
even if you can't go to a local pub after work, make sure you're setting aside some time for that self-care because it is very important. Your mental and emotional well-being is just as important as your day-to-day responsibilities. Yeah, I agree. And I guess, you know, back to the idea of like how to have a stress-free vacation, I would say don't diet during vacation. You're going to do the diet poorly and you're going to have a miserable time with your vacation. I would just be mindful of what you're eating. Try to enjoy the local cuisine because that's part of travel is getting a, getting a sense of a culture through the food and the places that they eat at and stuff like that. Um, the more active you are, the easier it is to keep the weight off from all those extra calories, just like it is back at home. If you can work in some physical activity, do that. I mean, I got day passes to, I got a three-day pass to the gym in London. You can do that. You can do a drop-in fee and still get a workout in to preserve some muscle mass um, or just even blow off some steam from the stress of travel. Bring Mm -hmm. comfortable shoes so you can walk a lot. It's a great way to experience a culture in a city. And, um, and don't stress about having a cider or having a gelato or whatever it is. Uh, if you put on a little bit of weight, you can work it off when you get home, but you know, Mm -hmm. don't go to extremes. Don't, don't diet and don't eat and drink excessively. Think about how your future self will feel when you get home and, um, be good to her. Yeah. That's my tips. All right. Well, thanks for the chat. And um, yeah, I hope people enjoyed this. If you have any questions, just comment below. Bye-bye. Bye.